This is Macro Voices with hedge fund manager Eric Townsend, the free weekly financial podcast targeting professional finance, high net worth individuals, family offices, and other sophisticated investors. Macro Voices is all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is, bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Serezna. Macro Voices episode 247 was recorded a day early this week on Wednesday, November 25th, 2020. I'm Eric Townsend. This episode is brought to you by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. And by the North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, ticker URNM, a focused play on miners and holders of uranium. Economist David Rosenberg is back as this week's feature interview guest. We'll discuss everything from what's holding up the stock market to whether bond yields have bottomed to the inflation outlook. Starting this week, I'll be hosting a second weekly podcast in addition to Macro Voices, and I'm really excited about this project. We'll tell you all about it and how you can subscribe for free right after the feature interview with David Rosenberg. And, of course, Patrick will have another of his famous post-game chart decks. All of that's coming up. And I'm Patrick Serezna. Now, Eric, let's jump to the S&P 500. Volatility did return after the options expiration roll-off, but it was to the upside, and the market is toying with breaking out to a fresh high. What's your take on this? I think everyone is vaccine drunk, if you will. Is that a new new expression? <laughs> and, you know, the vaccine stuff is really good news. There's no two ways about it. The world has been through just a, a horrible time for almost a year now that this crisis has been ongoing. And, um, you know, it looks like there's a light at the end of the tunnel, which is great news. I think that the world is really missing the fairly obvious data staring us in the face, which is right now... What's here and now today is the crisis is getting worse. Hospitalizations and new cases and deaths are all up substantially. But we can see that there's a light at the end of the tunnel. So as long as things go as expected and the vaccine happens, six months from now, it's going to be getting better. As far as the next six months, it seems like the market's just looking past it. I definitely want to ask David Rosenberg this question and see uh, you know, what happens not just between now and the end of the tunnel, but what happens after we're out of the tunnel and this really is over and we've got the vaccine. Where's the economy headed from there? All right, well, let's move on to the U.S. dollar, because last week we were talking about just it coming to the edge of that cliff, and we're under 92 at the time of recording. Like, is this going to now follow through in your mind? Well, we've been saying for weeks and weeks that 92, or rather a daily close below 92, is the key technical signal to look for to suggest that we're headed maybe considerably lower. I'd already come around to kind of expect that. I thought it was maybe a matter of time. Now, we don't have a daily close yet. We're recording before the close. At the moment, we're at 91 spot 96 as we're recording just right on the hairy edge there. So it might be over. Even if it's below, it's only a tiny bit below. We need to see a a real move substantially below 92 to really indicate game on, the dollar is headed lower. But frankly, uh, I think it's pretty darn likely that that's going to be what happens. It's just a matter of time. At least that's the way I'm looking at it. All right. Well, let's move on to crude oil because, well, we just took out the summer highs and this thing is pumping. Are we going to see 50 here? (laughs) Well, you know, I, I really enjoyed one analyst, I forget who it was that I read this morning, who said, oil bulls are like Donald Trump. They're so passionately believing their own story that they simply will not concede, no matter how much evidence is presented to them to suggest that maybe they should reconsider whether that's the the smartest course of action. Uh, I think what's going on here is everybody is totally focused on the vaccines and the light at the end of the tunnel and so forth. And I think that's right. I, I think that we are headed toward a really big rally in crude oil prices by the end of 2021. 
I thought we had a dip down on the current virus news. Maybe the market's just going to look past that. And as I've discussed before, it's kind of silly the way this works. You would think, since in commodity trading, we have a separate contract with a separate price for each delivery month, you'd think that what would be dramatically to the upside would be those contracts that are for delivery after the vaccine is likely to have uh, taken effect, you know, in the second half of 2021. Market just doesn't work that way. It's the front month futures contract that they buy on speculation, and they're buying it hand over fist. Inventory this week, crude oil drawing down 745,000 barrels. That's after API, the private service, had anticipated a big build on inventory. So it was interpreted by the market as a bullish surprise. Cushing, Oklahoma, drawing down 1.7 million barrels. Gasoline was the build on the board this week at 2.2 billion barrel build. Distillates, though, drawing down 1.4 million barrels. U.S. production up 100,000 barrels to 11 million barrels even. So we're not seeing the fall off in U.S. production, at least not yet, that Art Berman has predicted will occur toward the end of this quarter, the end of this year, and into next year. Tape action was to sustain the earlier gains, and that was despite the fact that Exxon published a bearish report saying they thought that the effects of the coronavirus crisis could linger on for the rest of the decade, for the rest of the 2020s, and they're anticipating lower oil prices because of it. Didn't slow the market down any. Uh, We saw a really big move at the point that news came out. I think the market was at just over 45, and at one point we got to over 46. About 46 spot 30 was the, uh, the high on the day, coming back off of that late in the session. All right, well, let's move on to gold. And I want to talk about this chart when we get to the post game, but the feet got kicked out from underneath and we dropped down to the 1800 level. Is there more downside in gold from here? Well, I've been saying for months to watch for a retest of that $1,800 level or just above, and uh, sure enough, I bought more gold this morning at $1,800. Uh, the next clear technical level is around $1,757, and I'd buy some more there. Now, you know, we could be bottoming here. The 200-day moving average is now just above the market, so maybe we'll see a reversal. There certainly is a significant technical level here that would suggest that's possible. I think a considerably deeper correction is possible. And almost counterintuitively, the reason has everything to do with the rally in Bitcoin to new all-time highs. That's a little bit of an involved discussion. Let's come back to it in the post-game chart book when we can look at charts of both gold and Bitcoin. Sure. Let's touch on the 10-year Treasury yield. Now, the 10-year yield, we're around just under uh, spot 88 on the yield. It looks like it's rolling back up with uh, all of these commodities rallying. Do you think a little bit of inflation fear is going to start getting uh, baked into the cake here? Yeah, I don't really have any opinion short term on which way you know the next week is going to take us. But I really think that rates are probably have bottomed and are going to start turning up in anticipation of a return to inflation. Now, that's been my view. I definitely want to encourage our listeners to listen to David Rosenberg in the feature interview, who's going to express an opposite argument. He sees it the other way. In any event, the the long duration trade, I think, is over here. David says the opposite. So you'll hear you've heard my views in previous episodes. I'm not going to repeat them now. Let's tune in for David Rosenberg and hear the other side of the argument. All right. Well, this week's featured interview guest is economist David Rosenberg. Now, Eric, why did we invite David back this week? Well, Rosie, of course, is an icon in the industry, and he has been on this inflation versus deflation debate for a long time, and he's been right for a long time. And, you know, at this point, I think we are headed toward inflation. He still sees a deflationary scenario. And he does describe in this interview what it would take to get to an inflationary outcome, but he doesn't see it yet. I don't know if I'm right or if David is right, but I do know this is the really important topic to get your head around, is to figure out which of us is right. And so we try to present as many different contrasting views as we can. Eric's interview with David is coming up as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. This episode of Macro Voices was made possible by Abex Technologies, a company most of you have probably never even heard of. What's more, Abex will also be sponsoring Smarter Markets, a free new weekly podcast that I'll be hosting. 
which launches this Saturday. So what the heck is Abex Technologies? The short answer is they're both a fintech startup and a new commodity futures exchange that will apply the latest technology to redefine how markets themselves work in coming years. In the interest of full disclosure, I myself am an early investor in this company, and I'm really excited about their future. So stay tuned for the post-game segment after the feature interview with David Rosenberg, when I'll be back to tell you about the new Smarter Markets podcast, as well as details of another interview that I'll be doing this weekend with Patrick and Kevin Muir, explaining the backstory on ABEX, who the principals are, and what their vision is for modernizing futures trading by redesigning the markets themselves. And now, with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me now is David Rosenberg, founder and president of Rosenberg Research. David, it seems like pretty clearly there's a light at the end of the pandemic tunnel at some point in 2021. We're probably going to have a widespread use of a vaccine that hopefully will bring this thing to an end. So I want to talk about first between now and the end of the tunnel. Seems like uh, a lot of stuff is getting worse on the pandemic front, at least in the immediate term. Cases and deaths and hospitalizations are up right now. On the other hand, the vaccine is coming. So how do we reconcile those things? Do we do we think the market's already looking past what's going to happen in the next six months toward the light at the end of the tunnel? Well, I think that the market is looking uh, maybe past, uh, you know, the next three months. You know, if you believe the experts, uh, they're going to start to rule out these vaccines any time now. And that every American will hopefully, you know, if, if these uh, results, uh, these positive results, from the drug makers have any validity to them, uh, you know, we could be talking about the second half of next year, everybody who wants to be inoculated will become inoculated. And so that's why uh, the markets have looked through the uh, raging pandemic, and uh, now we're back to new highs practically on hospitalizations. Deaths are going up, although they're lower than they were during the spring, but still problematic. Uh, You know, the sorts of numbers from a health crisis standpoint that would have caused the markets to go into a tizzy just six or seven months ago, and especially when you consider, you know, these um, new restrictions and curbs that are spreading out across the country. But you're quite right. The markets are looking at that flicker of light because six, seven months ago, uh, nobody was entertaining the thought that we'd get a vaccine or get vaccines, plural, as early as we're going to. I mean, it really is uh, a modern day uh, medical miracle. I think the markets uh, are pricing that in. I think they're pricing in that uh, once we get a certain critical mass, there's going to be a huge unleashing of pent-up demand in parts of the economy that uh, we haven't been partaking in, either willingly or uh, out of force. So whether that means hotels, motels, theme parks, uh, entertainment, travel, tourism, uh, restaurants, bars. Uh, So all that we'll see uh, in maybe the second or third quarter, third or fourth quarter of next year, we're going to get a couple of quarters of boom-like economic conditions. And that's what the market's focused on right now. The question I've been asking is, you know, what does life look like past the tunnel? Because the tunnel has shortened. There's no doubt there is a flicker of light at the end of that tunnel. That's what's been driving the markets in the past several weeks in particular. But at some point along that tunnel, and as I said, it is a shorter tunnel now, what is life going to look like beyond that tunnel? Because at some point, the markets are going to have to confront uh, that reality. And that reality is going to look quite a bit different uh, than a couple of quarters of unleashed pent-up demand that gives us, you know, six months of exceptional growth. Equities look ahead. They are, by definition, a long-duration asset. At some point, we have to come to grips with what the world's going to look like, what the economy's going to look like, past that unleashing of the pent-up demand. And I think it's going to be much like we had in the previous 10 years when people say to me, oh, I can't wait to go back to the old normal. Remember that old normal was low growth, low inflation, and low interest rates for a variety of structural reasons that haven't gone away because of the pandemic and the fight against the pandemic. In fact, uh, the structural impediments to growth have been accentuated through this period. And so when we talk about the old normal of being low inflation, low growth, and low interest rates, uh, I think that growth, interest rates, and inflation will be even lower 
once we get past the end of that tunnel. And then we'll have a different repricing in the financial markets against that backdrop. That's very interesting. We've had several guests telling us, okay, look, they're going to do so much monetary accommodation because of this situation that it just has to lead to a shift to secular inflation. Sounds like you're on the opposite side of that. Return to deflation, even more deflation. Well, you know, uh, it's like deja vu all over again. Uh, These are probably the same people that were telling you in 2010 that uh, to be braced for a decade of inflation because, of course, the Fed was embarking on quantitative easing and we had that initial boost in the fiscal deficit from the uh, Obama fiscal package on infrastructure. Of course, we coupled that with the Trump tax cuts. We finished the last cycle with a trillion dollar deficit at a time of full employment. And yet, what was inflation? Basically, two. And um, so, I think that we could have a future of inflation down the road. Uh, Who knows what this, you know, we have Jenna Yellen, uh, a former Fed chief, take over at the Treasury. Last time we had that happen was William Miller in the late 1970s. Well, I guess we we connect some dots between something happening that's going to draw the Fed and the fiscal authorities that much closer together. We have to keep an open mind. But we do have a massive gap between demand and supply. The pandemic was both a supply shock and a demand shock, but the hit to demand was a lot bigger. And so I think it's going to take several years, and it would take years of exceptional growth in demand before aggregate supply and aggregate demand meet at a point uh, that's going to generate sustainable inflation. So uh, I think that uh, it's certainly a narrative. It was a narrative for most of the past cycle that we're going to get the big inflation And it never materialized. Now, I imagine if we end up monetizing the debts and the Fed loses control of the monetary base and velocity stops going down, you can build a case where inflation is going to come back sooner rather than later. But the point I'm making is this. What were the fundamental forces at play that led to the what we call secular stagnation? We did have a form of secular stagnation, despite what the stock market did, because we had the biggest debt for equity swap on corporate balance sheets in history as companies issued debt to buy back their stock to the point where the share count of the S&P 500 last cycle went down to a 20-year low. So you can provide the illusion of some marvelous earning cycle because the share count goes down. But you see... It was the weakest economic expansion on record. We had tremendous monetary accommodation. I mean, the Fed, even when the Fed was raising rates, what did it get to? Two and a half percent of the funds rate? We haven't had such a low level of the funds rate at a peak since the 1930s. Uh, At the lowest point, the Fed could not even get its balance sheet below $4 trillion. The Fed's balance sheet at the tightest point of Fed policy in the last cycle was five times bigger than the balance sheet had been historically. And the funds rate got to 2.5%. The Fed wanted to go to 3% in the fourth quarter of 2018, and it couldn't even do that. Then we had the Powell pivot. What's all that telling you? What's it telling you really about the fundamentals of the economy? Leave the stock market aside. The stock market is not the economy. What does it mean about the economy? that the Fed, you had Jay Powell coming in in January 2018 (laughs) telling you we're going to normalize interest rates, and they couldn't even get within 50 basis points of what Powell's own definition of normal was back then. Of course, the Fed's adjusted that estimate ever since. It's telling you that we have too much debt. We have too much debt. We are choking on this debt. Now, of course, you can argue that all the debt greased the wheels for ending the recession very quickly in February and March and April. All that much is true. But now we are living with total debt to GDP, government, business, and household. That's almost 400%. We've never had this condition before. And um, that's going to be a huge tourniquet on growth going forward. People say, well, especially the MMTers, And the people advocating massive government debt says, well, just bring it on because we can finance this with such low interest rates. It's like when when homeowners tell me they take out a mortgage, they say, boy, why am I still paying the bank every month? Because I was told interest rates were zero. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you still have to pay off the principal. You still have to pay off the principal. We're paying off the principal of a gigantic, unprecedented peacetime economy. And uh, that's going to take a chunk out of economic growth for a long period of time. So you see these factors of massive indebtedness 
uh, huge constraint in aggregate demand. That's gotten worse through the pandemic. This is what the markets might not see right now because they're focused on the light at the end of the tunnel. We get to the tunnel. How do we resolve these massive deficits and debts? How do you really forecast an era of accelerating growth? You know, there's people out there that are saying, oh, this is going to be like the roaring 20s. We came off the Spanish flu of 1918, 19, into the 19. Well, not only do we have a different demographic base, a much younger demographic base, but the government basically didn't do much to prevent the pandemic. Uh, it was a different society back then, a different culture. But the reality is that ended up just developing herd immunity without the government doing anything. We didn't have massive government debts and deficits to deal with the situation in 1918 and 19. So that left the government the opportunity to the 1920s with a strong government balance sheet to do what? To cut taxes. We had massive tax reduction in the 1920s. Now, I don't know how this is going to play out because the U.S. population just basically voted against tax increases, up ballot and down ballot. There's no room to cut spending on the discretionary side. We have tremendous demographic pressures on fiscal finances. So maybe the answer is going to be we'll just monetize the way out of the debts. And if that happens, I'll probably have to change my inflation call, but I'll actually wait for that to happen. I mean, that would be called the big bazooka, outright debt monetization. I mean, that would be huge. And uh, maybe Janet Yellen being at the helm means it's going to happen sooner rather than later. But that's just being speculative right now. What we know is that we come out of the pandemic with really three things that are problematic that were made worse. Massive debts, aging demographics. The pandemic didn't change aging demographics being a powerful deflationary force on the economy and a powerful force that weighs against aggregate demand growth because older people don't tend to spend as much as younger people do. And then on top of that, the gaping income and wealth inequalities, which got worse, got worse, still unresolved. And every academic and scholarly report has shown that extreme income inequalities acts actually a detriment to economic growth. So I don't know, they're saying the structural factors that brought us low inflation, low growth, low rates, unexpectedly. I mean, we had a lot of very bright people who are experts on the fixed income market telling us that bond yields in the last cycle were supposed to get to 5 or 6%. People were saying that after Donald Trump got elected, that he was going to unleash the animal spirits and we we're going to get tremendous reflationary tax policy and that bond yields were going to go through the roof. What was the roof? 3%? <laughs> so you see, um, it, it's a complicated outlook, but I would say that the fundamental secular forces that are almost Japanese-like in nature that led us to slow growth, low inflation, ultra-low interest rates are going to be at least as much in force, if not more so, Barring some other shock, and maybe the shock is going to be the debt monetization shock. I don't know what else is going to happen. The demographics are not going to turn around. We're not going to have a baby boom in time to turn aggregate demand around to create the forces of inflation. And the debt burden, it to me, is the biggest deflationary force globally. Uh, we've all turned into Japan. So people that talk about the inflation and the reflation and all these other things, uh, use Japan for the past three decades as your template as to how far that's going to go. So uh, barring some unforeseen shock on the demand side, or if we all just turn into isolationists and populists and nationalists, and we all turn inward and globalization goes into permanent reversal, that would really be an inflationary impulse on the supply side. Exactly where's the inflation going to come from that it didn't come from in the previous 10 years? David, I appreciate your comment that the stock market is not the economy, and everything you're saying about the economy is very insightful. But obviously, our listeners have an interest in the stock market. Now, if we went to the old, old normal, you know, the 20th century old normal, the things that you're saying would naturally lead to a bearish outlook for stocks. But needless to say, the last 10 years, it seems like the rules are different. So where do you see the stock market performing in, in the face of all this? Well, look, it's a... Um Look, the stock market has done far better than I ever would have thought that it could do. And there's no doubt that we've had tremendous policy stimulus. And we've had great, uh, amazing vaccine news, light at the end of the tunnel. But, you know, when you're looking at the Schiller, the smooth, what's called the CAPE, the sickly adjusted price earnings multiple, which is really the best way to look at the market because it looks at the multiples over 10-year periods. And the stock market, by definition, is a long duration asset class. And the PE multiple on the CAPE is 32. We've actually broken above the pre-plunge peak of 30.7 in February. So 
I mean, look, who's to say that the market can't go higher and higher here? But I mean, it's getting into nosebleed, nosebleed valuation territory. Now people say to me, ah, valuations don't matter. Focus on momentum. That's fine. You know, there's momentum, there's the technicals, there's the fund flows off the charts. The, there's, there's four bulls for every bear. When you're taking a look at the broad surveys, the bear's been beaten in a submission. Uh, sentiment is off the charts. But really, what does a 32 PE multiple on a 10-year scrolled earnings backdrop tell you? It tells you that really your expected real return in the equity market for the future is basically close to zero. Uh, those returns uh, have been harvested. You know, <laughs> We've had uh, over a six-point multiple expansion uh, just since the market bottomed in March. That doesn't happen every single day, even off fundamental lows. And so um, the market is, is too expensive for my liking. But then again, it is a stock market, and it is a market of stocks, and it is a, a market of ideas. So I would say that, um, firstly, if you do believe in the in the vaccine trade, and that things will, if they don't go back to normal, go back to quasi-normal, there are a lot of items in the value proposition that would have some upside potential for the next few months. You can point to the airlines, you can point to casinos, uh, you can point to hotels, you could point to uh, mall REITs, uh, in fact, uh, residential REITs, aerospace defense. There's a lot, there's many segments of the market that uh, can still close the gap, or even if they closed half the gap to where they were trading in February, uh, could make it 10 to 20%. I mean, some of these sectors like autos and uh, even the restaurants, you know, have already gone back to those levels. So there's still some opportunity in those value stocks. I should add uh, the banks uh, as well as being areas that could have uh, some catch-up potential here. But I'd say that, you know, in the future, what I would want to focus on is I'd want to focus on investing around, you know, the classic works of David Ricardo and Adam Smith and focus your investments on what is scarce globally. So I would basically be focusing on scarcity value. That means I want to focus on growth. I want to focus on growth stocks, but growth stocks that have utility-like characteristics, but also are well-priced, and most of them are still too expensive. So I'll wait for the valuations to return to normal, but growth is scarce, therefore, own growth at a reasonable price. Yield is scarce. I mean, look, we're at, you know we're talking about uh, a world where $17 trillion of bonds trade with a negative yield. I mean, we have a situation where the Greek two-year bond yield is negative, and the Greek five-year bond yield is three basis points away from being negative. Think about that. Greece, a junk bond, is uh, trading with a negative yield at the front end of its curve. Is incredible. That's the investing world that we're in. We're in a world where high yield, high yield trades at a 4.9%. How are you supposed to be doing any reasonable capital asset pricing model? How are you supposed to be really calculating what your hurdle rate is on your business when you have central banks buying corporate credit and high yield bonds to the point where you've driven such a big wedge between what is reality and what is true fundamental risk reward. So we do know that that's probably not gonna end. Uh, we have about 30% of the global bond market trades with a negative yield. Uh, yield is scarce, so you wanna own yield. So dividend yield, dividend growth. You know, I'm talking to you up here in Canada. Look at the Canadian banks, look at telecom, look at the uh, selected REITs. I wouldn't say office REITs, but I'd say that assets that spin off a reliable income stream should be part of your portfolio. So we can talk all day long about the market, but there are still some opportunities beneath the veneer of the market, and it comes down to idea generation. So I'm talking about investing around scarcity. I would argue, by the way, what else is scarce is safety. So you have to ask yourself the question, you know, as we're talking about, well, the equity market, and I know that a lot of the listeners are all about the equity market, but the question really comes down to hopefully nobody's 100% anything. But what is safe? What's safe in your asset mix? And, you know, I always get guffaws when I mention the necessity of having a substantial portion of the portfolio in long-duration, high-quality bonds. I get derisions of laughter. But you see, the U.S. long bond yield is 1.65%. And that is a giant 
In a world where 30-year German bonds are negative 15 basis points, JGBs are plus 60 basis points, UK yields plus 90 basis points. Most of the world, if it's not negative, you're measuring their yields in basis points. At least in the U.S., you can still measure it with a percent. So you own bonds in the portfolio to manage your risk. So I say to all the listeners, ignore those pundits who say to dump your bonds because yields are too low. That is one of the most ridiculous statements I hear on a daily basis. They're low because as a price, the bond market is telling you that we are heading into a future of ultra-low expected returns. And that's the basic point that I'm trying to make here, is that treasuries are a ballast and a stabilizer in the portfolio at all times. People come and say to me, well, isn't there inflation risk and duration risk in treasuries? Of course there is. But what makes treasuries unique in everybody's portfolio is their payment safety characteristics. They are the only assets where security and certainty of payment is assured and guaranteed. And I know the question was about the stock market, but the stock market does not have certainty of payment. The Treasury Strip is the benchmark risk-free asset for funding actuarial liabilities. It is the only investment vehicle with no default risk, no call risk, and hence no reinvestment risk. It's the only thing you can buy today where you know exactly how much money you're going to have 30 years from now. And then I'd say that uh, the fourth and final item uh, that is scarce is called um, inexpensive assets where you could find them. And everything right now in the United States and in many parts of the world are just too expensive. And partly because central banks have all but destroyed the equity risk premium. But there are uh, faraway places, I would say, dare say, like China, Southeast Asia, where assets are cheap, the P multiples are in the low teens, in a region that's emerged, I'd have to say, in much better economic and financial shape coming out of the pandemic. And I would say that China is destined to capture an ever larger share of global GDP in coming quarters and coming years. I don't think that's going to be reversible. So I would conclude that the last item here in terms of scarcity is looking for inexpensive assets. And you can get that in many parts of the emerging market landscape, especially in Southeast Asia. Now, you, you just made an excellent argument for treasuries from a safety of repayment standpoint. But as far as expecting duration risk to be a long trade that's going to pay because of a secular move toward lower rates. We're already pretty much at the lower bound. Do you think U.S. Treasuries go negative on on a 10-year yield at some point, or do you just mean that we're staying here at zero, we're not going the other way? No, I don't think that, uh, I don't think yields are going to go negative in the U.S., even though they've gone negative in many other jurisdictions. Uh, I mean, um, Germany is still a world-class economy. I mean, their their long bonds negative 15 basis points, but uh, you know, it's hard, it's hard to wrap that around around anybody's head. I, I don't really think we're going to negative yields in the United States. And of course, you can have those negative rates in uh, in Europe because you're backstopped by a central bank that de facto has embarked on policies of negative rates at the short end of the curve. I don't think we're going there. I think the Fed's already told you we're not going into uh, negative rates. But my point is this. My point is that it's not like you're going to make a huge amount of money in treasuries. I do think that the most uh, attractive part of the curve, looking at how steep it is right now, is really the long bond. And we don't have Fed risk. The Fed's already told you they're not raising rates for at least the next three years. It's probably going to be even longer than that. And um, I don't think we have much in the way of of big inflation risk. Uh, I think people really have misunderstood how difficult it's going to be to generate the inflation. And it's going to be even tougher, in my opinion, than it was 10 years ago when people, again, were talking about big inflation. So the point I'm making, though, is that there are times, like, like, take a look what's happened. We have a a 1.65% yield on the long bond after about a 70% run-up in the stock market. I don't think the stock market's running up another 70% from here. I mean, 1.65% on the long bond. I mean, as Billy Joel would say, that's all you get for your money after one of the biggest risk-on reflation trades of all time, and we're at 1.65% yield on the long bond. What happens, God forbid, if the stock market stops going up? So the point I'm making, I said it was a ballast and a source of stability in the portfolio. It's not like you're going to make gobs of money anymore 
in the bond market. I mean, if yields were to go down below 1% at the long end, yeah, you'll, you'll pick up a lot of price appreciation. But that's not what I'm talking about. I was talking about that one of the scarce resources globally is safety. And the treasury market, there's nothing safer than that. And so I would say that at a, at a minimum, in your portfolio, if God forbid we ever get another correction in equities again, I know most people think that can never possibly happen, your bonds will be a source of stability. Your total return in your portfolio will not go down with the stock market. That's what I'm talking about. It's an insurance policy. And again, we have to take a look at what the rates market is telling you about the future. And this is the signal. You have to take a look, not just, oh, do I buy a bond at these levels? Why would I buy a bond at these levels? The rates market is telling every investor on this call that we are heading into a future of ultra-low expected returns across every asset class. That's the signal. You have to take a look at what interest rates are telling you about as a price, as a price signal about the future of expected returns. And they're extremely low, which is why you're going to have to get your hands dirty, go beneath the veneer, either start to go into other markets globally that are cheap, or go into some thematics or sectors within the stock market that still have some upside potential. But as an asset class on its own, the 1.65% yield on the long bond is very similar to what the message is from a 32 Kate multiple in the stock market. Future returns have been ground down to very low single digits. That's the story. Now, I can just feel the gold bugs screaming out in their sleep saying, wait a minute, David, the whole argument in favor of treasuries is either the yield that they pay or the expectations that you have that duration risk is going to buy you price appreciation. You're saying expect neither one of those. If that's the case, why in the world would you want treasuries over gold, which at least gives you a negative real yield hedge? As I said before, you can buy gold. I'm bullish on gold. As we've seen in the past couple of months, the Russians have been selling gold in the open market to replenish their foreign exchange reserves that were depleted by the earlier slide in oil prices. If I own the long bond, I don't have to worry about what the Russians are going to do with regards to their gold export policy. I don't have to worry about what the dowry season in India is going to look like from a demand standpoint. Like, Don't get me wrong. I like gold for similar characteristics, but the reality, as we've seen just in the past couple of months, is that gold prices can go down. No matter how bullish I might be on the gold price, I can't give you an ironclad guarantee as to what you're going to get back in 10, 20, or 30 years. What I'm saying is that in a world where safety and certainty of payment is not assured and guaranteed, the market that gives you that is the treasury market. I said before, what is it you're going to pay for, for a security that is the only thing in the world that is AAA that you can buy today where you know exactly how much money you will have 30 years from now? So in an uncertain world, and it's going to be an uncertain world, I know we have certainty over vaccines, perceived certainty over vaccines. I would say it is certainty it's a matter of timing. A lot of uncertainty over what the world is going to look like once we get past the flicker of light at the end of the tunnel. And so I'm not going to say that you want to have 100% of your portfolio in treasuries. I don't believe in zero, and I don't believe in 100. Uh, I've been in the business long enough to know that you don't put all your eggs in one basket, and there actually is no such thing as a sure thing except for this is that the treasury strip is the only, only thing you can buy where you know exactly how much money you'll have 30 years from now. David, before we let you go, I want to make sure our listeners are aware. You used to work for a private wealth management firm for the entire year of 2020. You've been out on your own with Rosenberg Research, a new firm. Where does that leave? The Breakfast with Dave newsletter is probably one of the most famous pieces of writing in the industry. Do you also have other products? And what business are you in at Rosenberg Research? Tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, well, you know, going out on my own uh, has given me the opportunity to... Um provide uh, a whole array of products and services. Uh, Breakfast with Dave, you know, is still the flagship, but uh, I do another very quick daily. Uh, before Breakfast with Dave, we do a gamut of special reports. You know, we've done one on, on the U.S. political situation. We've done one on practically every asset class. 
the outlook for China, 10-year growth outlooks uh, for the major countries around the world, the inflation-deflation debate, uh, demographics. So I'm able to spend, and I have a crack team behind me too. This is the best economics and strategy team after being here 35 years in the business. I have a crack team and we're putting out unique and innovative and thought-provoking research that ultimately <laughs> always ends with uh, an investment conclusion as to either how to make money or save money by how we see the world unfolding. So you're right, Breakfast with Dave is a flagship, but we're producing uh, a whole array of uh, different publications and uh, webinars, so whether it's verbal or whether it's uh, written, you can have uh, as much access to us as you possibly want. Uh, I invite everybody to go on the Rosenberg Research website. Just Google Rosenberg Research. And uh, we have a one-month free trial. So you can kick our tires and check it out. And um, I'd say that, uh, you know, I started in this business in the mid-1980s, and I feel like a kid in a candy store. It's actually uh, the most gratifying thing that I've ever done in my professional career, starting this business back in January. Well, David, we look forward to getting you back on Macro Voices for another update in a few months. Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right after this message from our sponsor. Uranium, the fuel for nuclear power, is a contrarian investment whose returns are historically uncorrelated to other asset classes. Low uranium prices lasted for many years after the Fukushima meltdown, leading to substantial supply destruction. At today's prices, uranium mining is uneconomical even for the world's lowest cost producers. Uranium demand is already estimated to exceed existing supply, and future demand growth is expected. New mines aren't economically viable at today's prices, leading analysts to predict that the price of uranium may need to double to over $60 per pound to incentivize sufficient new mine supply to meet expected demand. The NYSE-listed North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, ticker URNM, offers investors exposure to both miners and holders of uranium. For more information, visit urnmetf.com. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Eric, great interview with David Rosenberg. He really puts into perspective the challenges that investors face into 2021. But now let's move on because I'm sure a lot of our listeners are curious to hear more about Abex Technologies and the new Smarter Markets podcast they're sponsoring with you as their host. So let's start off with the company itself. I'm sure most of our listeners never heard of Abex Technologies before. What's the story on this company? Who are the founders and uh, what business are they in? Well, let's start with the founders. Josh Crum is the ex-Goldman Sachs commodities guy turned fintech entrepreneur who's best known as the founder of Gold Money. That's the company that lets you have what's essentially a bank account denominated in gold, complete with a debit card that you can use in the mainstream financial system. The other founders are veterans of the commodity industry, senior guys who were involved in designing the NYMEX exchange and other commodity exchanges. As to the business that they're in, it's a complex subject. The short answer is that it's both a new commodity exchange that will be based in Singapore, and it's also a fintech startup that will be applying the latest technologies to modernizing and redesigning how markets themselves work. But frankly, that's an oversimplification. Now, folks, I'm dying to tell you the long answer and dive into the gory detail about ABEX and their vision of modernizing financial markets and so forth, because frankly, I think it's a really exciting story. But it presents a little bit of an ethical conundrum for macro voices, because first of all, it wouldn't be fair to our other advertisers if I spent the whole postgame segment talking to you about ABEX and why I'm excited about investing in the company and its prospects. And second of all, there's an inherent conflict in that I am an investor myself, and we don't want macro voices to turn into an infomercial for my own 
own business ventures. That's not our charter. That's not what Macro Voices is about. But of course, the flip side of that coin is that we very much are here to tell our listeners about opportunities that we see in investment markets. And this is one that I'm really excited about investing in myself. So to resolve this conundrum, we decided to just save the discussion of what Abex as a company is all about for a separate interview that I'm going to do with Patrick and Kevin Muir on the Market Huddle podcast this Friday, November 27th. That way, the conflict of interest has been eliminated. So, Patrick, good luck to you and Kevin on shutting me up in that interview because I'm really excited to tell you all about the long answer to your question of Abex, what the company is, and where they're headed. Okay, let's leave it there with respect to Avex as a company. Now, our listeners who want to know more about it can tune into the Market Huddle on Friday and hear the full backstory. But Eric, you're also launching a new weekly podcast where you're the host, and there's definitely no conflict of interest for us to discuss that in detail. So the Smarter Markets podcast premieres this Saturday on November 28th. What's it all about? First of all, I want to assure everyone it is not an infomercial for Abex or anything like that. Josh Crum was very emphatic in saying he wants to sponsor something of substance so we give listeners a chance to hear content that they really want to hear. So the first idea we had for this new podcast is it was going to be called Commodity Legends, and the idea was to interview some of the biggest names in commodity trading and get them to tell their best stories and so forth. So the idea was to attract an audience of futures traders, people interested in commodity markets, and just use the podcast to generate some name recognition for Abex as the sponsor and give our listeners a chance to hear from some of the brightest names in the commodity trading business. Then one of the guys on the Abex team had a much better idea. As we'll discuss in detail on the Market Huddle on Friday, Abex's mission is redesigning how markets themselves work using technology to improve the design of commodity futures markets and make them work better than they did previously. So we realized, wait a minute, if we're going to recruit some of the biggest names in the industry for this podcast, why spend all of our time having them just tell us their war stories? Why not engage them in a serious conversation that taps into their knowledge of the industry and ask them to weigh in on how the markets themselves need to be redesigned and improved in order to better serve everyone from hedgers to speculators to financial institutions. Put another way, if a natural part of the work that Abex has to do in their mission to improve the design of commodity markets is to ask experts in roundtable discussions and so forth, what's wrong with the current market? Well, why not do that research in the public eye in the form of a podcast that lets everybody in the industry tune in and basically, uh, you know, think of it as in front of a live studio audience. What we're going to do is redesign how futures markets work by considering what's wrong with them, what their shortcomings are, and how could they be improved. And we're going to do all of that in front of a live podcast audience. Patrick, for me personally, this was a godsend. Originally, this was going to be this war story podcast where I was going to be the host and Abex would get their name promoted and, you know, it was going to be a bunch of cool stories and that was it. But now it's changed completely. As most of our regular listeners know, I was a software technologist in my first career. And for over a decade now, I have been pulling my hair out in frustration with how pathetic the electronic trading systems are compared to what they could be and what they should be. It is just appalling how badly the financial industry has failed to embrace technology to design markets that work better than the markets that we have today. So if you remember the movie Trading Places with Eddie Murphy and Dan Aykroyd, where commodity trading was depicted as a bunch of crazy guys in suits, jumping up and down like wild animals, screaming bids and offers at the top of their lungs. Well, as far as I'm concerned, all we've really done with electronic commodity trading is to computerize and automate those same stupid antiquated systems of bids and offers that existed and were depicted in that movie. So I've always been appalled by how primitive the design of these electronic market platforms is compared to what I know is possible as a former distributed systems architect in my prior career. What we've done is almost nothing to modernize and improve these markets. Well, Abex is a company that's all about doing exactly that. How are they going to do that? I get to talk to the smartest guys in the industry, the smartest commodity guys, 
ask them what's wrong, bring my technology knowledge to the table, and try to get a conversation going with them about how we could use technology to engineer smarter markets, hence the name of the podcast, in order to make the market work better than it used to. So I'll be hosting this new podcast where I talk to some of the biggest names in the industry, and we'll talk about what's wrong with the market, how it could be improved, and what we could do to make it better. And uh, it's called Smarter Markets, and it premieres on uh, Saturday. Well, that sounds really interesting, but I can't help to wonder if the guests that you're going to be having are veterans in this industry, and, and clearly they're, they're going to be qualified to talk about the shortcomings of the markets, at least as they're presently designed. But uh, why do you think those are people that are the right people to brainstorm about how to fix the market using technology? Well, you know, that was my greatest hesitation as I kind of wondered, are they going to get it? Are they going to be ready to talk about distributed ledgers and some of the technologies that I think are interesting? And I was really surprised when I taped the first interview, which is uh, Robert Friedland. A lot of listeners already know Robert is uh, an iconic figure in the mining industry, the guy who built Ivanhoe Mines and became a billionaire in the process. So I figured it'd be great to, you know, hear his war stories and stuff. But as far as talking about technology, I was skeptical. And frankly, I kind of have, I guess it's a prejudice about mining executives. I think of them as like Indiana Jones characters who probably wouldn't know that much about the technology world that I grew up in. Well, Robert Friedman blew me away. Before I could even bring up the technology, this guy's talking about how he thinks a blockchain could be used to create an audit trail so that he could sell his green copper, what he calls green copper is, you know, responsibly produced copper that, that respects ESG priorities and so forth. He's saying we need smarter markets that allow him and other miners who produce commodities responsibly and in an environmentally clean way to be rewarded for doing so. And he's talking about how to use a blockchain in order to do that before I could even get a word in edgewise. You know, this guy's designing the technology. I don't know if all the interviews are going to go that way, but I am already amazed at the quality of guests that we've got lined up. And I think we're going to have some very open conversations. The other thing is it's not just about the technology. We're talking about redesigning the function of these markets, what they do and how they work. Robert talks in the interview that airs on Saturday about about how he envisions markets where there's grades of commodities that are not just graded based on the commodity itself, but how the commodity was produced so that the market can use its own free market price discovery to figure out what premium people want to pay for responsibly produced commodities that follow ESG principles. So it, it's fascinating stuff. And it's not just technology. It's also designing functionality. Well, I can't wait to tune in for that first episode featuring Robert Friedland, which premieres on Saturday. But Eric, will McRoy subscribers get the new podcast automatically or do they need to subscribe separately? You have to subscribe separately. And we figured this is a completely different subject matter than Macro Voices. We don't want to spam anybody with content that they don't want. So Smarter Markets is a brand new podcast. It's still completely free of charge, just like Macro Voices. But you're going to have to sign up separately in order to get the episodes delivered to your mobile device automatically. Now, here's the rub. There's lots of different podcast apps these days. The good news is on the big ones, which is Apple Podcasts and uh, Spotify, I think we're already in there. So if you go to Apple Podcasts, type Smarter Markets in the search box, it'll pop right up. There's a big red icon that says Smarter Markets with host Eric Townsend. That's me. Click there and you're subscribed. On some of the smaller podcast apps, we might not be in there yet. So if you're having trouble finding Smarter Markets, particularly on those other apps, just go to the page macrovoices.com forward slash smarter markets. There's an RSS feed URL there, which you can use to manually subscribe on almost any podcast app. Bottom line, if you have any trouble finding anything or searching for smarter markets, just go to macrovoices.com forward slash smarter markets. Registered users will also find a link to that page in your research roundup email as well. And right now on that feed, there is an eight-minute podcast. It's really just a trailer introducing what the concept is. The first full episode with Robert Friedland will air on Saturday, November 28th. And so I definitely encourage you to subscribe now. Just put in Smarter Markets in your Apple Podcasts or whatever app you're using. Subscribe now so that you'll automatically receive that episode on Saturday. Patrick, let's move on now to this week's post-game chart deck. Talk us through what's going on here. 
All right. Well, listen, I started here within the first four charts, just breaking down the U.S. equity markets into some of the different indices, the S&P 500, NASDAQ, and the Russell. And really what I wanted to capture here is while the S&P has, on page two, been working its way higher, it has not yet broken that first vaccine news high. But it has been constructively working its way higher, and it's been relatively bullish. But it hasn't broken that out. When you look at the NASDAQ, NASDAQ on page three, it is in a similar situation. It really sold off on the first vaccine news. It's really been a very quiet place, but it's edging back toward those highs. But really on page four is where the real story is, which is that the small caps gapped higher and just have not looked back. I mean, we have more or less seen the small caps running and we're seeing just strengthen so many of those value sectors that were beaten up, the, the financials, the energy stuff the resource names, all of these different subsectors are really taking substantial money flow in a rotation. And that's where on page five, I think that there's the interesting story, which is this idea that uh, there's a new rotation underway. Now, this chart only captures about a year of data, but if you go back even two, three years, there's been one pronounced trend, and that is that the NASDAQ and growth story have been materially outperforming that of the small caps. And for the first time, we're seeing a scenario where this uh, trade is kind of basing. And the bigger question is, have we seen a major reversal? When I showed this chart several weeks ago, it was just literally the first part of the breakout. And we were asking the question, is it actually just a fake out or is there actually going to be real follow through on this? And so far, that uh, rotation of follow through has materialized and has continued. And I wonder whether or not this is going to be a sustained trend going forward in the, in the coming weeks. Patrick, I find it very interesting that the small caps are where the outperformance is. And it makes me wonder you know, to what extent is this being affected, particularly in the United States, by the passive investment programs that just tend to, to keep investing regardless? What about the international stocks? First of all, what are your, your thoughts on that question? But what are the international stocks telling us in terms of whether this trend is, hey, the, the vaccine news was it, it's the sell the news moment, or, or whether we're actually headed higher from here? Yeah, well, on page six, I was showing just a chart of the Nikkei. And uh, in the prior weeks, we were showing just how these breakouts have been occurring in Europe as well uh, on the Eurostock 50. But this has been a breakout in global equity, whether you're talking emerging markets or developed markets around the world, whether you're talking Kospi, whether you're talking about uh, any of the EM spaces or, or India or China, uh, we're seeing global equity in full breakout mode, Brazil, Canada, Australia, and there it's, it's actually a robust rally. And another really interesting trend is just simply the fact that global equity is really starting to participate, but will it out perform the U.S. equity because that's a another storyline that's been there is that you wanted to own U.S. equity because it was the best performing global equity market out there. And it had the safe haven of, of a U.S. dollar that was relatively stable. But are we now entering a period where, where this is really going to now distribute the money more evenly and whether there's more alpha or upside out there in these global equity markets? One way or another, Nikkei broke out in a pretty big way. And this chart is only showing the one year but we're breaking up some pretty significant levels. And it'll be really interesting to see whether or not this continues to be a, a market that continues to outperform in the coming year. Patrick, let's move on to the dollar index, because of course, the question you have to ask yourself, at least about the US indices, are the stocks really going up or is just the denominator that they're priced in going down? The US dollar hasn't broken down below that key support level yet, but boy, it's trying to. Well, and you know, it, it's certainly, uh, if, it, if we close down here at the end of the day, then this will actually be the lowest close, even though we had that little shadowed candle where it traded in that late August, early September, a little bit lower. But it's not just about the technical level itself. It's the fact that every single rally that the US dollar has tried to put together in the last several weeks or, or even last several months 
almost immediately gets faded and the distribution is very systematic. And so the sellers are clearly the dominant force in this price action. And I don't know what kind of uh, miracle the dollar bulls will be able to pull out to create a reversal here because with this type of negative price action, it looks like it, it could just break through this level the way gold did. And and really at this stage, uh, if, if this level gives out, we're talking about the next major target and support line being that 89.90 level, which was our, the 2018 lows. And I think this is sing one of the single most important macro trends to watch going into the rest of the year, because if we spend the next three, four weeks in a serious dollar downtrend, the macro implications are pretty significant, right? Yeah, and I wouldn't be surprised. I, I think it's probably coming and uh, it's going to have significant implications for crude oil and for gold and everything else. Let's move on to page eight, which is basically forecasting the price of Canadian beer for Americans on uh, after the pandemic <laughs> ends. What, uh, what is this chart telling us? And does this mean that you're buying the beer at the next Macro Voices Live? <laughs> that that I am. But what we have here is a U.S. dollar that continues to deteriorate uh, against the Canadian dollar. But this is, uh, we were showing the Aussie dollar last week, but this is a trend that continues. But Canada is a little uh, sensitive to, a little more sensitive to the commodity story than most currencies. And with oil breaking out the way it is, it'll be really interesting to see whether that ends up being a headwind for the U.S. dollar and actually drives a breakdown of that U.S. dollar. CAD to the downside. And so uh, we're at the edge of the cliff on this currency pairing as well. But this is where I wanted to go to chart nine because the Canadian dollar does somewhat link to crude oil. And th there's this chart on crude. This is the January futures contract. And there's the break of that August, September high. And uh, we're, we've just broken out and everyone's in disbelief at this stage of the momentum that's here. But this is like an acceleration in the momentum. Is this a complete fake out in your mind or uh, or is this got follow through? Because technically, the fact that it was able to beat all of those summer highs with such velocity as a testament to some serious buying pressure. Well, I think there's two sides of this story, and it could go either way, really. I mean, on one hand, you're right that it feels like it's overdone in the face of a massive increase in coronavirus infections and hospitalizations and deaths right now. And the vaccine is not until into 2021 sometime and so forth. The thing is, the bullish case in the second half of 2021 is really, really strong. And the arguments are, first of all, what people are being told is that by June, you know, everybody's going to be vaccinated. I'm very skeptical of that. I think it's more like by Christmas, most people will be vaccinated. But the market's being told that it's by the middle of the year. And the other thing, although it hasn't been confirmed yet, if you listen to not just Art Berman, but quite a few oil analysts, they're all saying U.S. production is going to fall off a cliff in 21, and there's nothing that can be done to stop it. So what we have is a setup for demand to recover as supply is collapsing and supply is expected to collapse in a way that cannot easily be remedied because of a lot of the long-lasting impacts that the coronavirus crisis had on the U.S. shale industry. So is the market just missing the current news or is the market correctly looking past the current news and anticipating that there has to be a really big rally before 21 is over. And, you know, maybe just the vaccine news was the catalyst to unleash those animal spirits to get it started now. If this is going to reverse, if this is a, a fake breakout that's going to reverse, which I think does make plenty of sense considering the short-term negative demand news because of the extra cases and so forth, it's got to turn around pretty quickly. If it doesn't reverse quickly, I think we're just off to the races to higher numbers. And uh, as that analyst that I mentioned earlier said, you know, it's it's acting like Donald Trump. It's, it's the, the bulls are so... Just so completely convinced of their case that they're not going to concede regardless of the evidence. You know what's really though interesting, Eric, is that when you go to the energy stocks themselves, they have been a pretty good leading indicator of the direction of oil. I don't know whether this is a sustainable trend, but like back in the, uh, in the summer, energy stocks started selling off for months before oil finally broke down. And then when this turn happened, these energy stocks have been just leading the way higher and they've just been continuously pumping higher. And then oil is always playing this game of catching up on these breakouts. And it's going to be really 
really interesting to see whether or not the energy stocks are going to give the tell again this time around. That's certainly something I'm watching. Anyway, let's move on to page 10 and 11, which we have the charts of both gold and Bitcoin. Now, I intentionally put Bitcoin on on a weekly chart because I really wanted to capture the bull market of 2017 on the same chart. But what we clearly have was this scenario that earlier in the year, everyone was talking about the correlation of gold and Bitcoin. And well, that's gone. I mean, at this stage, uh, the Bitcoin has, has just blasted off to the upside, going full parabolic. And gold is actually distributing in here. And, I mean, this with this breakdown, there are some major support lines and FIB levels down on gold about 50 to $100 uh, lower from here i mean maybe the there's still potentially you know 50 dollars more downside risk on the most immediate term but it's amazing that this kind of divergence has happened and it'll be really interesting to see whether it does the exact opposite that when bitcoin finally peaks out and i'm not trying to say that in a bearish way like to, but like a, any parabolic rise like this always has its rise checked you can go to any point in the previous rises on bitcoin to see the distribution cycles that often follow but will be interesting is that if bitcoin does put in a short term top and starts to backfill this move will that potentially see the opposite happen where that money will find gold again do you think that it's as simple as that or is it going to be a little more complicated well, I do think there's a strong causal relationship here. And what's going on, I think, is that gold and Bitcoin are competing. The The message that we see in the economy is very strong. Fiat currency is going to be debased by central banks around the world. Everybody wants to put on their favorite central banks debasing fiat currency hedge trade. Everybody sees the, the same fundamentals. It's just so clear as day. What's happening is there's two favorite instruments for that. Long gold is kind of the old folks version, and the newfangled version is long Bitcoin. And I think what is happening here is as people see Bitcoin outperforming gold, it becomes a self-reinforcing vicious cycle where people say, well, boy, I didn't really believe in this newfangled Bitcoin stuff. I'm not really sure what it is, but boy, it, it really is performing better okay, I'm going to sell my gold and buy Bitcoin instead. And I think that's what's driving this. Now, as I've said many times on Macro Voices, my strongest and most important rule of investing is never make the mistake of expecting that the market is going to do what you think it should do or what the right thing is. Uh, I think that the pro-Bitcoin argument is misplaced. Uh, I'm not going to go into a lot of detail on that because I wrote a whole book explaining why I don't think Bitcoin will be the ultimate winner in the digital currency revolution that's going to change the face of finance completely over the next 25 years. But, you know, I I'm not the only guy and there's a whole lot more guys who disagree with me than there are who agree with me. The people that are driving Bitcoin higher are passionately engaged in believing that it's going to be the you know the center of the financial system replace the u.s dollar as the world's global reserve currency uh, i think they're crazy to think those things but those views are getting a lot of traction and a lot of popularity and the more that you see the price of bitcoin outperform the price of gold the more the gold guys are saying okay i don't really understand this but i can see it's working better I think what happens is exactly what you said. First of all, I wouldn't be surprised because you know, right now we're just running into that, that previous high resistance where Bitcoin is struggling to get above its previous all-time high from a couple of years ago. If we see a breakout above 19,000 or whatever the old number was, I've forgotten, whatever the, the previous high was, and it, we start seeing 21,000, 22,000, I think it's going to accelerate from there and you're going to see a blow off where Bitcoin goes crazy, crazy, crazy up. That could very easily drive a substantial correction deeper down in gold at the same time. Eventually, as you say, there will be a blow-off top in Bitcoin, and that will create an incredible buy-the-dip opportunity in gold. I'm hoping that Bitcoin goes crazy, you know, 
through the roof to the upside. Not because I'm long Bitcoin, I'm not, but because I think it's going to push gold down and allow me to buy more. Uh, I can't imagine we'd go below 1350 but if you wanted to know what's the one thing that might be the catalyst to get gold back down to 1350 it would be a, you know a, a moonshot in Bitcoin up to forty or fifty thousand dollars or whatever crazy number it might be that would be the thing that would probably cause a lot of faith to be lost in gold and I, I think it's a buying opportunity in gold I'm not worried about the the Bitcoin rally eventually reality will set into that market in any event, Patrick, I can't say with certainty how that's all going to play out, but I do know with certainty that our listeners can get a free 14-day trial to your service, Big Picture Trading. Folks, for anyone who doesn't already know, Patrick does online webinars four days a week with chart decks like these, and you can get a whole bunch more details. So go to bigpicturetrading.com, sign up for a free trial, and don't forget to tune in to The Market Huddle, Patrick and Kevin Muir's podcast this Friday, where you'll find my detailed interview on Abex Technologies and the investment play there. Folks, if you're interested in uh, a really cool fintech startup, especially Especially commodities traders, be sure to tune in for that interview. I haven't been this excited about an angel investment in a very long time. We're going to leave it there for this week's show. This episode was made possible by the North Shore Global Uranium Mining ETF, ticker URNM, a focused play on miners and holders of uranium, and by Abex Technologies, pioneering the design of smarter markets that better meet the needs of both market participants and society as a whole. Patrick, what can they expect to find in this week's Research Roundup? Well, you're going to find the transcript for today's interview, as well as a link to the chart book that we just discussed in the post game. There's also a link to a, a Snyder article, a lesson on PMIs, relative versus absolute, and a link to a, an article titled Gold, Testing Patience but Towing the Line for Now. So you'll find this and so much more in this week's Research Roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program easier even better. Now, for those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets and would like to share that content with our listeners, send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter, and we will consider it for our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend and myself at Patrick Ceresna. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thank you for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at macrovoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. 
Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints presented on Macro Voices. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com and by funding from Fourth Turning Capital Management, LLC. For more information, visit macrovoices.com.